in the gun episode number 56 here as we've got some offensive line grades to discuss more big 12 expansion conversation and uh, another round of college football hall of fame voting that has some mountaineers and some mountaineer connections for us to discuss uh, plenty to get into here on your new favorite WVU football podcast. This is In the Gun. I'm Wesley Euler with the best teammates in the business. I got the signal caller, Jed Drenning, our buddy Owen Schmidt, going to join us here momentarily. Of course, the runaway beer truck himself. In this episode of ITG, brought to you in part by our friends at Bet Online. Folks, Bet Online is your number one source for all your championship information, stats, news, and scores. You can get the latest odds and lines, the latest matchup reports for this year's NBA and Stanley Cup finals. BetOnline is your sports intel headquarters this season and has you covered for all your inside uh, sports wager. Sorry, for all your insider sports wagering needs from basketball and hockey to baseball, UFC and boxing. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to get all of your betting information, including live betting options and your favorite casino and card games available to play right from your home. So get into the action today, head to the website or use your mobile device to join and be sure to use the promo code believe when you sign up to receive your 50% bonus on your first deposit. That's B L E A V at bet online where the game starts jed how we doing partner you're reading that like a dad that hasn't slept in a couple weeks huh? yeah i tell you what i mean it's uh it's been about four hours max of sleep every night and it's you it's funny you and i have laughed about this before like that's how you normally operate you're kind of a sleepless psycho and i mean that in the most respectable way but possible. i always explain to people look it's not a superpower that's why i'm always tired <laughs> it's not like i can do that <laughs> and, and, and i'm you know, God, and my 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 yeah. wife is like you. God bless her. Like she she can somehow just get a couple hours of sleep and you know not only survive but I would say thrive as well too. I I am a little baby when it comes to sleep. <laughs> if I don't if I don't get at least like six or seven hours, I am worthless. And so uh, yeah, if I'm if I'm a little off kilter, if I'm not as uh, as crisp with the ad reads as normal, I do apologize. Uh, as we are still in that uh, that fog of war, early early baby stage here now on week three, but everything's going well, and uh, and hopefully we'll we'll start to sleep a little bit more through the night. But hey, anyone who's anyone who's been in this spot before knows what I'm talking about, right? You know, you're you're a dad. You know the drill. It's it's not your first rodeo. Uh, it is not. You know, I got a nine year old and a nineteen year old. And by virtue of my 19-year-old's job training, I was up at, you know, a little after five this morning Ooh. on the road, 20 to six, something like that. We were in Jackson's Mill by 7 and 20 uh, and uh, dropped him off to stay in the same building that I stayed in in oh. high school uh, for a leadership camp where my dad dropped me off. But, oh, by the way, I was boarding him with the stories that, hey, do you realize that this is where the Mountaineers actually had training camp? They had two days back in the 50s and the Pappy Lewis days, right up the road from uh, from Freddie Wyant, uh, you know, yep. old Lewis County boy. I bet he was yep. bringing everybody home for dinner. But uh, but yeah, sure enough. Uh, so the, the kids are the single biggest reason you won't sleep for the rest of your life, even oh, when they're out of their own probably is. Believe me, I know it. It's uh, it's like the only part of this fatherhood thing I don't like, if we're being honest, is the, is the, <laughs> is the, is the, is the detriment to sleep. But hey, you know what? It's a sacrifice that I certainly... Uh, am willing to make this episode of ITG also brought to you in part by our friends at Toothman Ford folks we all know cars cost less than Grafton make sure you're getting down to Grafton to check out uh, all the great inventory they have there at Toothman you can also uh, they've got everything online as well too. take a peek see what you're getting into get some ideas uh, before you head to Toothman but you gotta head to Toothman who's doing uh, doing great NIL work our friends at Toothman Ford of course we all know cars you. cost less than Grafton this is the conversation I was having with my son, one of many that we had on our way to, to Lewis County this morning. If you had a choice, would you rather continue to live as you today or live 100 years ago as the wealthiest person in America? Because think rather about it. I'd rather live, as me. I'd rather, li rather live as me today. Easy. Think about it. Technology makes that an easy yeah, decision. Yeah, I mean, okay, so that's it was – Travel traveling back then was a disaster. No air Everything conditioning. Everything was a disaster. Hygiene I mean, was a disaster. You were lucky to find air conditioning if no you were air, Yeah, color. no air conditioning. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. I just I can't I can't flip on the TV and watch fifty seven different sporting events at once. Yeah, you don't I'm, have a phone. So there's, okay, well, Jed, I, Jed, Jed, it. Jed. I'm also this is I mean this is a world without Star Wars, without Lord of the Rings. I mean, what, what are we talking about here? You'd be a heck of a storyteller, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> but, true. So so here's the second part of the question. All right, if not 100 years ago, which would be 1923, is the wealthiest person in America. Although, wait a second. If I was Fast the wealthiest forward. person in America okay. 100 years ago, 
I would have made sure the, the 1922 WVU football team got crowned as national champions as they should have. And they wouldn't be traveling cross country by train back in the twenties, right? Right. I would so, have flown them to San Diego, that, and then we yeah. would have been celebrating the national championship on the way back. So here's the second part of it. All right, if not 1923 as the wealthiest man in America, uh, gradually go forward a year, five years, ten years at a time. 1930, 1935. I mean, there's reasons all through history because my sure. kid's a history buff like me. I mean. You don't sure. want to be, oh, man, 1929, here comes the Depression, you know, the uh, the crash of the stock market, the next handful of years is rough, and then you get into the World War II years. I mean, right. It's a rough couple of decades. It's so a rough it couple rough, decades. All right? So at what point do you kind of settle? Obviously, if you get to 2022, you're doing it. You're signing up. You're going to be the richest man in America in 20, right? So I'd start in the 60s. Point? The six, Yeah, the 60s is where there I would go. start to sign up. You know what yeah. he settled on? He decided, Dylan decided, Early to mid nineties. Of course, he it's wasn't around for that. He wasn't it's built. Good. Yeah, he wasn't born until 04. But he said, I've always thought the nineties kind of seemed cool. I bet it, it was, was fun to live. It in. was the Dylan. It was it was very cool. It was very cool. It was great. It was the last so, great uh, decade, in fact. I said I'd probably, you know, you got the internet starting to come around. So he said, I'd probably sign up for that. Said, hey, it was a fun conversation to have. It's just that anyway. is that is a fun conversation. I think I'd go, I think I'd start the 60s, but I wouldn't want to go much, much before that. I at least need to be able to go to concerts, man. I mean, concerts and sporting <laughs> you events. You do. That's, that's right. You live there. That's, that's right. I, 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 that's, that's, that's what, that's what I'm all about. So, uh, so yeah, I, I like that though. That's a fun, that's a fun, got that's some time to kill in the car yeah. with your, yeah. with your son and, and, uh, and discuss what decade you would go back to being the richest person. Yeah. That's a fun, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I might do it in the 20s just because being the richest person, would be a heck of a flex, but no, no, bear in mind, no but, air conditioning and no color sports on the out. TV is a tough one. I mean, I got, I don't Dylan even, I don't even have too. black He's and like, white mountaineers on the television. That's right. You don't even have that. He made a good point. He's like, well, one of the perks that would be kind of cool, but I don't know who'd be kind of cool to offset all the downside. Let's say you get into the 40s, 50s, 60s. If you're the richest guy in America, you're probably getting to hang out with Sinatra, that's a good point. Elvis. That's a very so good that's point. That's kind of cool. And that's, that timeless, is, that is right? cool. That that's is cool. timeless. But at the same time, you know, you got to worry. You get a slightly bad infection. You're not making it. <laughs> if you if you don't advance far you enough, cut your, the, you cut you your foot stuff. out in the yard doing, yeah, uh, you know, right. cutting yeah. the grass or doing some. Although, if I'm the richest man in America, I'm not doing any yard work, baby. But yeah, We're you could you could, weeds, but that, that you, know, you could you could drink some rock gut whiskey and uh, and not make yeah. it to the end of the week. That's that's for sure. <laughs> All right, let's let's rein it in here. That was that's good though. I like that. Let us know in the comments what decade you would have to go back to the richest person in America, or if you would just go back to 1923 and say, Assuming you could take your family and friends in some capacity. They don't know what's going on, just you do, but you don't want to lose your family and friends lean behind. So that's part of the deal. You get to take them with you and they have lives and whatever you settle. Well, see, now that would actually be fantastic, not to continue this wormhole here, but uh, not to brag or anything, but I think if we went back 100 years, myself and some of my friends, we'd probably be like some of the better athletes of the time as well, too. I mean, That's just with our, with our yeah. with our advanced you know, uh, with know, our advanced nutrition admit, and I, health and training I, that I we have back, in the future. I can go back as far as I want to. I'm not going to be one of the better athletes. I mean, I, I can go back a thousand years. I'm just not going to be one of the better athletes. Jed, if I could take my hockey equipment now with me back to the 20s oh. and then and then drive up to Toronto oh. for like a, a pond hockey tournament, and I'd have all those Canadians head oh. on a swivel with all this oh, futuristic boy. hockey That's equipment. That That's That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Jed, let's uh let's transition here. Let's let's talk a little offensive line because Pro Football Focus yes. has uh put out there by conference their highest returning uh highest graded returning offensive lineman, I should say, and they released the numbers for the Big 12. Well, uh good news and maybe along the lines of what we expect and what we've discussed with the strength of this West Virginia not only offense, but I think the team as a whole should be, and we're hopeful that it will be that offensive line when you consider some of the talent, some of the experience, uh, the pedigree that they have returning there. Well, according to uh, Pro Football Focus and their Big 12 returning offensive lineman grades, at the top of your list is Zach Frazier. He is number one in the entire conference. And then just a couple spots down on the list here uh, at the seventh spot, I believe, is Wyatt uh, Millam as well, too. So two in the top seven, two in the top ten there, if you will. Uh for highest grade of returning offensive linemen right. that jives a little bit with what we're saying. And, you know, this is, it's exciting to me in a way too, Jed, because you, you see Wyatt on there, you see Zach on there, but Doug Nestor isn't even on there as well too, who That's I think right. we're all expecting a big season from. Yep. It, it's nice that 
it's nice to see what we think backed up from a national perspective. It's not just us saying, hey, this sure. offensive line has a chance to be special and to be a real backbone of this team. You're getting some of that that recognition from from other areas as well, too. Yeah, what's cool is, you know, the folks at PFF, uh, you know, there's varying opinions on, on the work they put out, but they're sitting sure, there sure. and they're watching tape and they're actually studying tape. And there's different metrics that they analyze and put together. Uh, so they're looking at, at a pass pro grade. They're looking at a, a run blocking grade. They're looking at a little bit of everything. And this is the composite. So the fact that Zach comes out uh, cream of the crop in the uh, in the Big 12, again, that's not that surprising. It's nice to be one of only two teams in the league. And this is including every team in the Big 12 because you see a Houston kid, you see a BYU kid, UCF. Sure. So it's all 14 teams. So to have two of the top seven, that's really impressive. And as you touched on, there's no mention of Doug Nestor and the versatility he's going to provide. There's no mention of Tomas Remack, uh, a freshman All-American at the left guard spot. So uh, we have a lot of pieces to build from on that offensive line. And the only other team with two in the top 10 is Baylor widely regarded as one of the better units in the big 12 conference. So I think it speaks volumes to the possibilities for this unit. I've said it many times. I do see a path in which this offense can be a great offense, but I don't see a path in which this offense could be a great offense. If this offensive line isn't as exceptional. I completely agree. it It just can't happen without that. I completely agree. I don't see a situation where Garrett Green suddenly throws 40 touchdown passes and, and you know, we've got a trio of wide receivers that are all going for a thousand yards and a handful of touchdowns. I think yeah. you're right. If if we look back at the end of the season and we say the offense was one of the better units in the Big 12, um, I it, it, it involves all those guys, certainly. Sure. And Garrett Green has to be good. The wide receivers have to do their part. CJ comes back healthy and takes a step forward, but it, it begins and ends with that well, offensive Nico. line. Or Nico, that certainly as well, too. We absolutely. That, yeah. absolutely. And uh, and and not just CJ in the backfield. A lot of hands in, in that pile as well, too. But again, when you consider the pedigree that a lot of these guys came into the program with, the experience and just the knowledge that they have in terms of starts and, and with each other and the chemistry and the offense and the amount of snaps played in the conference, they – they really have a chance to to be the best unit in the Big Twelve, and even one of the top two, maybe. And, and that would be that would be huge for for this offense and for the team as a whole. The possibilities are there. We know the depth we enjoy in the running back room. So this offense, in some ways, especially with the athleticism coming out of the quarterback room that we haven't had in several years. Uh, it could be a unique combination to maybe set the table and be just explosive enough on the perimeter uh, with some big play opportunities set up by our success or possible success in the run game. But none of that's going to happen if we aren't exceptional at literally at the point of attack with yeah. Zach Frazier and his band of renown. I think you're absolutely right. That's where it all begins and ends for this offense, for this team in 2023. And uh, they will obviously have a tall test to get things going when they when they roll into Happy Valley against a very good Penn State defense here in, uh, in just a little under 100 days, actually. This episode of ITG also brought to you by our friends at GoMart. Make sure you're signing up for your GoMart rewards as you travel throughout the Mountain State and onward. GoMart here to keep you going. Jed, one of the... Uh, Cooler things, you know, when when we did our schedule release episode of, I don't know, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, everything's blurring together for me at this point, right? I'm in that new, I'm in that new, new baby fog of war stage where everything is, it perpetually feels like 6 p.m. at night all the time, all the time. (laughs) And, uh, but one of the things that we did discuss on that Big 12 um, schedule episode when, when the schedule was released is how it was exciting that you get all four new conference opponents on the schedule this year. Right. You, you don't you don't have to wait. You get to you get to see all four of those in some capacity, whether it yep. be home or away this season. Sure. Uh, of course, Houston, BYU, Cincinnati and UCF, the four schools that I'm referencing. Those four schools are going to have to go up against what we hope is the best offensive line in the conference. Well, Jed, this is an ongoing offseason topic, an ongoing topic really ever since we started this podcast about a year ago. Uh, Big 12 expansion, and particularly in the last few weeks, we we spoke last week about how there had been a lot of discussion around Colorado continuing, how, you know, yes. we'd wait for some updates and some rumors to leak out of Big 12 media, or uh, sorry, Big 12 uh, meetings, which uh, which took pr- place at the Greenbrier this year. So what do you got for us on Big 12 expansion? What's the latest? Where are we at? And uh, anything that kind of, you know, grabbed headlines here in the last week? I, I keep finding myself deferring to, 
I Y W T. The longer this goes on, the more <laughs> I feel convinced in your mark we trust, right? I mean, he's aggressive. He doesn't sit back and wait. He's beaten George Klyavkov to the punch a couple times already. He got our media deal settled. The first order of business when he took the job uh, was to straighten out what was going to be the exit strategy for Oklahoma and Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, everything he said he would deliver, he has delivered. And now he came out and said at these meetings last week that we are going to continue to be aggressive and we would love to be a national brand as a conference. So the names that start to surface, Colorado has been in the news for a while. It's almost to the point, Wes, it's starting to feel eminent with Colorado. It yeah, really is. Yeah. Now, now, let's explore that for just a minute. You'd ask yourself a program, as we mentioned in last week's podcast, that's only had one winning season since 2005. It's a shell of what it was uh, as a shining member of the old Big 12 when they were co-national champions in the early 90s. This isn't that Colorado, but here comes the sizzle ahead of the stake in Deion Sanders, right? As we speak of the sizzle ahead of the stake, we're walking the beer truck into the fold right now. <laughs> oh, and we're talking about Big 12 expansion. So uh, Dion at Colorado. So here's what you got going on. People wonder, why is Dion being asked his opinion on something that will impact the long-term fortunes of the University of Colorado? Well, first of all, they want to make sure that he's settled in the way that he wants to be settled. But here's the way I see it. If Dion has success, he's not going to be there long, right? Correct. Well, that's a good thing for Colorado, isn't it? Because if Dion were to leave in two, three, five years, whatever the timeline might be, that means that we're much closer to that Colorado we were just talking about and not this stagnant version. So either way, it's a win for the Big 12 if, in fact, that happens. Now let's jump from that into the possible basketball schools, okay? Now, Arizona isn't just a basketball school. Arizona is a basketball blue blood, yes, but they would also be a football component to what we're talking about if, in fact, that comes into play. Now, one of the things we're learning, they don't seem to be tied at the hip with Arizona State. No, they, they could, don't. They could act yeah. completely independent from that. But, Owen, I kind of frowned initially on the idea of bringing a Gonzaga or a UConn as just basketball schools. But it seems like here's Brett Yormark's thinking. We're trying to fortify ourselves in the Big 12 as the third strongest college football conference right that's kind of up for grabs it's, it's been settled with these media deals that seems that the sec and the big 12 they are what they are well who is conference number three we seem to be in the best position to be that but you know what we are and can continue to be we're the sec of college basketball now granted college basketball doesn't steer the ship uh, I, i'll give you an example just last year, John Calipari was lobbying for a practice facility at Kentucky. Yep. And he made the claim. You remember this when he made the statement? <laughs> hey, do. look, I love our basketball program, but we're a bas or our football program, but we're a basketball school here at Kentucky. And Mark Stoops took exception to that. And it was pointed out that in the fiscal year, the prior year, Kentucky football had generated 40 million, Kentucky basketball just under 30 million. Not so fast. So the money's in football, but if you can position yourself, we're already the preeminent basketball conference. Nobody's going to really argue that. And if you can add a blue blood in Arizona, if you can add Gonzaga, let's say it's basketball only, UConn basketball only, the value on the basketball side that you increase for the entire conference, because remember, anybody that's a P5 football member, the media deal was structured in such a way, again, defer back to Brett Yormark, it seems that if you're a P5 current member and join the Big 12, you get that same $44 million cut that we just enjoyed, that payout. So we're not dividing the pie further and everybody gets less. The TV and media rights deal says a new P5 team joins yep. Arizona, Colorado. You hear that, Utah? So now if you can take the basketball piece of it, Owen, and increase the value even further beyond everybody else and separate yourself from the pack – you position yourself as the third strongest football conference and easily the strongest basketball conference. That's not a bad tandem, right? Yeah. I mean, if you really look at it, you're looking, I guess, uh, total athletics, um, overall strength of conference. I mean, if you're looking at just football and basketball as a whole, uh, I understand where you're coming from just the football side of it, but yeah. building up the basketball side of it as well. I mean, that just, overall pushes the 
you know, the strength of the conference as a whole, for sure. I, I, I completely understand that. There's yeah, no I way think- to box us out of a national championship tournament mm-hmm. in basketball, which makes it a little tougher in football. You see what I'm saying? So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think you guys, I mean, you guys are kind of touched on this too, but there's just from a brand standpoint, I mean, there's there's no denying that the SEC and the Big Ten are a step above everybody else. Just from a brand neck recognition, you know, name brand standpoint, um, not to say that they are the best every single year, right? But just again, from that, um, from that, from that perception standpoint, in a lot of ways, I think all of this kind of encompasses all of this in the equation for the Big Twelve to solidify itself as that as that third brand, because it might, you know, being the strongest basketball conference, it it, it absolutely has its value. Um, it's, it's not football, but it is still something it's, it's the second yeah. biggest fish in the revenue pond, you know, by a, by a nice stretch is, is men's basketball. And the, the NCAA tournament is a huge cash cow is, you know, kind of Thank the crown, know. the crown jewel of college sports, honestly, when it, when it comes to postseason tournaments, if, if you are consistently leading the way in that conversation. I mean, this past year was the first time 2023 was the first time since 2019 that there hasn't at least been a big 12 team in the national championship game, which That's is pretty crazy. crazy to think. I mean, 2018, part of me was the last time because 2019 was when the streak started with Texas tech, when they lost in mm-hmm. an overtime of the national championship game to Virginia. So until this year, 2018 was the last time there wasn't a big 12 team in the national championship in basketball. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. I think there's a lot there from a brand standpoint uh, where over a decade of time, right. And you're winning three or four or five national championships in that decade. And you've consistently got teams in the final four and you are known as the with the SEC of college basketball, right? I yeah. think from a I think from a brand standpoint, that is very valuable. It's it's it doesn't translate translate directly to monetary like football does, but I think that can really help elevate you again into that kind of yeah. The SEC and the Big Ten, they're they're a step or a half step above everybody else, but then in that that clear cut next tier, it's the Big Twelve third, and I think I realistically, think that's where you're trying to be. There's room for very special exceptions that bring. It, it, you're not arguing. It's increased value. When you add UConn, all the national championships they've won under so many different coaches in the last couple decades. We all know the story. When you mm-hmm. add Gonzaga, what they've become. Uh, when you add Arizona, a blue blood by any measure on the hardwood, right? Those are three programs that each independently are bringing incredible value to your basketball product. No doubt about it. So if you want to make a couple exceptions and have some basketball-only opportunities, Gonzaga is the obvious one, right? Now, there's been some chatter, not a lot. What would UConn be? Would it, in fact, be just basketball? Would they park their football somewhere up? Look, it's I, – I don't know. I'm trying to remember. If you ever made the trip on the road to UConn, I've been up there once. Yeah. We worked that game. That's I played it. the game there. Yeah, it's twenty some miles from campus, right? It's it's not a large facility. It's 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 kind of unremarkable. It's not a real passionate football fan base. It's they they would have to change a lot of things to prove that they're serious enough about football to make a run on that front, right? I mean, that didn't that the impression you got walking out of stores or not? It's not even in stores. It's it's in East Hartford. So, yeah, I mean, it's just it's kind of like a bowl, and. Uh... It's, I think, a single tier. I don't think it goes. Yeah, you know I mean, I don't like. Yeah. What's the? It's what's, it's tiny. You know, what I mean, it's not yeah. in. Uh, probably in Big Twelve standards, they'd have to do a lot of upgrades. Uh, that holds forty. Of, holds forty thousand people. Actually, that's yeah, more than we, I would have expected. We, no, we it, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's a. It's but, a big. It's a big single bowl around the whole stadium, uh, or the whole football field. I just think they would need. Yeah, something. That's how you know. I mean, they need like the bling factor. You know what I'm saying? They absolutely. Nippert is Nippert's under forty thousand, but it's right in the middle of campus and the Bay Route that might be. I mean, there's a completely different. It's got an app. It's got an atmosphere. Yes, that's like Cincinnati. That's what's really cool about Cincinnati. Yeah, is uh, it's just right there in the heart. Yes, yep. and this yep. isn't. It's kind of yeah. detached. It's on its own. Like, we lost that game. Speaking of Zach Frazier, Zach Frazier was at quarterback, the Notre Dame transfer for UConn, when they knocked us off that night of the fumbles on the goal line. I just I remember walking out of there thinking, how did this happen? How did this happen? How did we lose to this team? But, uh, again, basketball, no doubt. 
uh, no doubt, nobody's going to, you know, be crazy enough to argue that they don't bring, bring incredible value. The football would be a very heavy lift. Now, it would be nice to be in a conference that you go back to the days of having an automatic win maybe for a few years. I mean, we <laughs> had that in a few years. Like, as Kansas gets tougher, the Big 12 is now devoid of that, right? But uh, so that's kind of the way I see it. You have Colorado's the centerpiece. Dion is the shiny part of that centerpiece. If he turns them around, great, because he's returning the value they once had. So they would stick around as a member. Arizona, that's a different animal. They'll carry their side on the basketball in football. They, you know, they, there's some history with that football program. So uh, it's not like something you leave on the curb. Uh, and, and then I'm looking at it like this. Uncertainty looms so large in the Pac-12. I mean, it doesn't seem like they can attract serious network attention with this media deal. Maybe I'm wrong and they'll have one tomorrow or the day this podcast launches. I don't know, but it just up to this point, it just seems so uncertain in terms of what's going to happen there. So if you're Utah, and again, our payout information just came out at the meeting last week with your mark, $44 million per school. That's before you get into tier three, okay? Uh, so it's additional to that. So if you're Utah and you're sitting there as a member of the current Pac-12 with no USC, no USLA, heading to, heading to the Big Ten, there's so much uncertainty. There's talk of Colorado leaving. There, there's chatter that they're reaching out to San Diego State, reaching out to Rice. Who knows what they might do? Meanwhile, if you can talk the Big, the big 12 into gaining entry, that's $44 million because the brilliance of the Your Mark deal, if you add a P5 school, no, you're not dividing it by one more member and everybody gets a little add less. Another, add another slice. Cut. If they're a P5, it would seem to be a no-brainer for a current big a Pac-12 school. Yeah. Would, would you jump at that? I would certainly think so. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Utah gets an invitation from the Big Ten next week. I have no idea. I don't see it coming. There is some chatter out of Salt Lake City that maybe they feel like they're a little too good for the truck stop conference, right? <laughs> I don't know. I think I'd be leaping at that, but maybe I'm wrong. The old truck stop conference, huh? The old truck stop. Yeah. Conference. The old well, truck. The old truck. Ball. The old truck stop conference is lapping them financially, so they could they yes. could they could call yes. it whatever they want to. That would be the broke boy conference, then I guess, if we're the truck yeah. stop conference. Yeah. But you know, that's that's a great point because you know, to, to just to to add to what you said there, real quick, Jed, before we get to kind of our final topic here, when when WVU first left the Big East to join the Big Twelve, we had a ramp up period of a couple of years before we finally got our yeah. full share of revenue. That's right. Yep. You have to kind of take it on the chin for a few years and, and just right. get a small cut before you're finally a full financial member, a, a full member with financial, you know, all the financial benefits. That's West when you started seeing the cranes outside Milan Pushkar Stadium was correct. when those cuts got larger. You're right. Correct. Yeah. And that was the way that it traditionally was done. You know, when, when Miami and Virginia Tech first joined the ACC, they had a couple of years before they got full revenue yep. share. Pitt and Syracuse, when they joined the yep. ACC, you know, it was, it was TCU when they joined the Big 12 with us. It was the same thing. They were they were only getting a, a portion of that pie at first before an equal share. Uh, to me, that's, I mean, that's a game changer in this regard because you don't have to think, you know, can we survive a few years with very low revenue? How's this going to affect us when we're already probably still recovering from the pandemic and lost football revenues, you know, just a few seasons ago? Um, Wes, where would Utah rank among the current, let's say, get Texas and Oklahoma out of there? They're sure, sure. off of the SEC. Where would Utah football, oh, and UA in too? Think about it. Where would football, Utah football rank if it joins the Big 12 in two years? It, it right 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 now they might be the best team in the conference. That's already. what I'm saying. I mean, other than bucks, other than other right? than Oklahoma, no. other than Oklahoma, they've probably had the best last decade of any program in the Big Twelve. Now, granted, I the mean, current structure of the deal that we we'll won Rose Bowls, year. haven't they, in the last decade? Yes. I, yes. Like Whittingham has done an incredible job. They've incredible. done every. They've basically done everything but make the playoff. I mean, that's, that's, right. that's all they've won the Pac-12. They've won the Rose that's Bowl. Right. They've been they they've been nationally right. ranked in the top fifteen and top they've ten. Delivered. As a new member in all the ways that Colorado never did. Correct. In the Pac-12, Correct. Right. They yeah, lived so, up to their villain, you know. So just so, forget forget brand, forget, you know, your the size of your fan base, because those things are more important, honestly, than your on field success in these kinds. That's why Rutgers and Maryland got added to the Big Ten, right? Forget all that ancillary crap. If you're just focusing on football, I think Utah is the best that you could add to the Big Twelve. Real, realistic. It's better football than Colorado than Arizona than Arizona State. 
Now, what um, are we playing for? Not this year, but next year. Louisville, Syracuse, playoff. Pitt, Virginia Tech. I mean, Utah's had a better program than all of them over the last decade. Yes, Utah is above uh, the cut on all those. Now, again, starting in 2024, not this year, you go to the 12-team playoff. Now, you have the six guaranteed seeds for the conference champs. Now, that could completely be restructured. I can't envision a world in which the Pac-12, or excuse me, the Big Ten and the SEC are going to allow that to continue beyond the couple of years that that contract's right. for. Right. But anyway, you're going to have an opportunity. If you're a Utah, you're going to be immediately competitive, much like you were in the Pac-12, in the new Big 12, plus a more stable payout. I really don't understand. Now, you've you got a couple of choices here, that, unless there is a Big Ten offer looming that I don't know about. I mean, I just... I don't see that happening, but it wouldn't be the first time I'm wrong. I can't imagine that happening, but it wouldn't be the first time I'm wrong. They think they're too good for the truck stop conference. Mm -hmm. Well, look, don't look now, but you're sticking around in the electric charging station station conference. That's, right. I mean, you know, that, that's what the Pac-12 is becoming. Right? I mean, yeah. what's wrong with being the truck stop conference? I mean, would it be, real quick though, is it something that they don't want to be in the same conference as BYU? Is that part of it? I think I thought it would work the I, other I've way. They, that would to, West, but I, they would want to pass but they would want to play as, B, like with us with Pitt. Like, we want to be in the same conference as you guys for the rivalry. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't make sense to me. It seems counterproductive. That was always the argument with Virginia Tech and Virginia and how there was chatter back and forth about when they entered the ACC. UVA wasn't happy about it. I, I get all that, but come on this is about survival and utah has to be looking at the bottom line and weighing the numbers and again if you think there's a way to stay in the pac-12 and survive long term and that it's sustainable you know something i don't because you're having serious conversations with the cw and on down the line uh i, I don't get it you think you would leap at a 44 million dollar payout that will continue to grow uh, in the years to come. So I, I don't understand it. And maybe they will, maybe they're just weighing their options and what's the rush because the Colorado thing does feel like it's going to happen this summer. I think so. Uh, certainly before football kicks off. Uh, maybe I'd say, I'd say before, I'd say that. before uncle Sam's birthday on the 4th of July is you probably could be right. And maybe that's the first here. piece that needs to move before the others fall into place, including Utah or whoever else I'm just speculating, but uh, it seems that in terms of stable footing, that seems to be the most stable opportunity that I see. Now, if you're Washington and Oregon, I understand you kind of holding out. Maybe I've heard that the Big Ten's not interested. That doesn't make sense to me. If, I, if I'm the Big Ten, first of all, you need some West Coast travel partners for USC and UCLA. That's going to be flat out brutal. So Oregon and Washington would seem to make sense. Yep. I'm pretending like I know things I don't. I don't at all. <laughs> It would just make sense, but who dares to make sense in this modern era where you're going to have Rutgers traveling for baseball games to uh, UCLA and USC? Uh, I, I don't get that part of it, but uh, let's see what happens. But this chatter is not going to die down. It's just going to intensify, and it'll give us something to talk about all through the summer and even to some extent into the fall. Hey, and for that, we are always grateful. Yes. We, uh, we are also grateful for our friends at Fortis for presenting this episode of ITG for roof performance and financial security guaranteed. Make sure you visit fortis.us.com. All right, as we start to wrap this thing up, gentlemen, final topic to kick around here, College Football Hall of Fame. Uh, the next class, I should say, of the College Football Hall of Fame is uh, is now up on the ballot, up for vote. And, Jed, we've got uh, we've got some Mountaineer connections on uh, on this year's College Football Hall of Fame ballot. Yeah, let's talk about how this works. Let's Let's set the stage for this, okay? There's... It's, it's really a four-step process. Uh, it, it's not like the NFL Hall of Fame where there's a, a committee and sports writers sit around and decide. No, no, no. This happens in steps, okay? First of all, over 5.6 million guys have played or folks have played college football. Uh, a select few are in the Hall of Fame. There's a first-team All-American requirement on one of the teams recognized by the consensus All-American team by the NCAA, which is five different teams. I'll hit on those, but that limits the number to a much smaller pool to draw from. There are 12,000 or so National Football Foundation members. We're going to post some information. If you want to be a member, anybody that's Joe Fan can be a member. You pay a couple bucks, you get a vote for uh, the people that are up on the ballot each year. So uh, there are roughly 12,000 of those. So they vote, as do the current Hall of Fame members. Now, that's after nominees are submitted by either a current athletic director, a current head football coach, or a current sports information director. 
So there's the nominations, then the voting takes place. And then from there, those votes are tabulated. Uh, they will vote and submit those tabulated votes to the National Football Foundation's honor court. Now, the honor court deliberates and selects the class. The honor court's geographically diverse. I mean, people from all over the country, so they don't play favorites in that sense. Uh, and it's made up of athletic administrators, Hall of Fame members, media members. Uh, so the 2024 class will be announced early in 2024 and then inducted in December 2024. Now, here's the criteria if you're a player. Uh, and this is sometimes somewhat frustrating because it eliminates certain folks, right? You have to be a first-team All-American on a team recognized by the NCAA and used to comprise, as I said, its consensus All-American teams. Now, those are five teams. The AP All-American team, the American Football Coaches Association, uh, the uh, Football Writers Association, the Sporting News, and the Walter Camp. Those are the five. So, first of all, that eliminates Pat White. He was never first-team on one of those yeah. five. So, there should be a body of work consideration that's what i would argue but you also you become eligible 10 years after your career ends uh post football record as a citizen is weighed in which is interesting because again michael vick you can say he's atoned for what he did but he's on the ballot this year uh the last game your last game had to be played within the last 50 years there are ways to get around that if special exceptions are made now coaches coaches only 230 of them have been enshrined they oh, yeah. are eligible three years after retirement, immediately after retirement if you're over 70. Active coaches like Bill Snyder was. When you turn 75, you can still coach <laughs> and be inducted. Okay, that's how that's how that happened. Nominations, again, are submitted by an AD, a coach, or an SID. Coaches have to coach a minimum of 100 games, and a winning percentage has to be 600 or better. Interesting, because it's crazy if you pay attention how many are so close to that cutoff. For instance, Ralph Regan on the ballot this year, his career record, I thought he's over 600. So I looked 75 and 50, exactly 600. So that's how close a lot of these guys are. Uh, now, once nominated, the players' candidates are submitted to one of eight district screening committees. Uh, there's, they're across the country in different regions. Uh, they conduct a vote to determine who appears on the actual ballot for that district, who represents that district. Then each year, 15 of the candidates that get a lot of votes, but maybe don't make it, bypass that screening process. So in other words, if you hit the four, you're nominated, then it goes to a district screening committee. Then it goes to those who vote, then it goes to the honors court, and here we go. Jeez. So this year, you have two Mountaineers, or at least former Mountaineers in the mix. Aaron Beasley is on the ballot. Uh, now, here's the thing with Aaron Beasley. Here's the, the hard numbers on him, and I'll, I'll give you my quick thoughts. A 1995 consensus All-American first team, 94, he led the nation with those 10 picks, uh, 19 career interceptions among the uh, uh, career leaders at West Virginia, two-time first team All-Big East at a time the Big East had a lot of stud DBs. Uh, now, here's one thing to think about. I always say that if you're a great corner, oh, and people try and throw away from you, right? So it's hard to pick off 10 balls. Well, Everybody, I think, remembers as Mountaineer fans. You remember the game Van Washington had against Louisiana Tech? The three interceptions, 172 return yards, the two long picks he returned for touchdowns. He had three PBUs in that game. Van Washington in that game had maybe the best game any corners had in West Virginia history. Okay? Part of that was because Louisiana Tech was throwing away from Aaron Beasley, who had a pick and a PBU himself on the other side. Mm -hmm. So he was even affecting things when he played the game when he wasn't touching the ball. So I think he's very deserving. Now, if you look at a guy like Jim Carlin, the Mountaineer coach, who, of course, led us to the Peach Bowl win in 1969, he was 25-13 and 13 at WVU. Let's go back to this. His career record, 107-69-6, Owen, that is – 604 winning percentage. See how many of these guys are so close to that 60%? It's nuts. Now, he left West Virginia after the Peach Bowl win, after that big 10 win season. Uh, of course, Bobby took over, who was his coordinator. He went to Texas Tech, did Jim Carlin. Uh, did a nice job at Texas Tech. Led them in 1973 to an 11 win uh, team and 11 win season and a Gator Bowl win. They upset number six, Texas. And then he had, uh, you know, a nice run at uh, South Carolina with some eight win seasons as well. So, He's on the ballot. Uh, I can see an argument being made at the success that he had at three different stops. And Larry Blakeney Owen, who is Neil Brown's mentor from Troy, is on the ballot as well. So those are two guys from West Virginia right there. 
what are your guys' overall thoughts on the process on those two uh, candidates and where we stand? Because I got somebody else that I want to mention here. But man, Beasley, uh, you know, honestly, a stud. I've, I've had a chance to kind of get to know him a little bit through some uh-huh. stuff with Brian Joswiak and uh, super creative guy too. I mean, he's come up with some technology that he's used with his trainings and uh, still very active. Um, if you watch like Twitter or anything on his page or whatnot, he's got like, he's still doing foot drills and his, his foot speed is, is absolutely tremendous. Um, still teaching the youth, um, and, and pushing kids, showing them the way, uh, to get there. And, uh, you know, I think he's a great pick, honestly, uh, an absolute stud in college and, and played what a decade in the, in the league. Close to it, I think. Yeah. Close to it. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, he hung around. Yeah. Nine years. Absolute, yeah. Nine yeah. nine year career, I believe. Yeah. So an absolute warrior in the in the National Football League as well. So I, I think he's a solid pick. Don't know much about uh the coach. Um, just personally, you know, no bees. And uh I think he's a solid pick for uh Hall of Fame. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we've we've had some great defensive backs in program history, uh, some first round picks, guys like Pac Man and Carl Joseph, um, some guys that had really nice NFL careers, even oh, more God, recently. Man. Like, yeah, Keith Tandy recently, pretty long NFL career. Rasul Douglas has had himself a nice NFL career. Um, but I think you could ve- I mean, even with Pac Man and, and Carl Joseph, I think you could very easily argue. And I'm not saying it's it's a layup or any like it's a no brainer yeah. or anything, like it's a conversation. But Aaron Beasley is in that conversation for best defensive back in program history. I mean, Jed, you mentioned the the ten interceptions his his last year. I think he had nineteen total. Yeah, um, and, and that that was at a time too where teams weren't throwing the ball forty five times a game like they are now in, in the nineties. Um, I just think uh, to be a consensus All American at that position, um, along with first team All Big East, I think Aaron Beasley. He's been on the ballot before. He should be in by now. Hopefully. He gets in. I mean, as you laid out that process, Jed, it seems way too complicated. I mean, does it? Do we really need a four tier, five tier process? Kind of <laughs> so there, there is, uh, listen, I don't think the NFL process is flawless either. But at least it's yeah. just you have a representative from each team, thirty two guys who have all covered the sport for thirty years, and they vote on it. At least it's it's pretty simple. Um, it's not it's not multi layered like this is. Um, you know, Beasley's, he's got all the accolades, first team, uh, all biggies, consensus, all American hall of famer at, at the university that he played for. I know this doesn't matter in terms of the college football conversation, but like we said, nice NFL career as well, too. Uh, to me, he's a no brainer and it's, 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 uh, it's high time we get him in there. What well, seems they're trying to find a way to have fan engagement and also generate some revenue. Let's be honest. Uh, it costs a couple of bucks to become a member, to win that right to vote. And that's one of just four steps. So yeah, it is, it is kind of, in other words, they don't give up control, but they do have some planet, some fan input. So that's kind of the way this is structured, but there's the football subdivision candidates and ballot, which we just talked about this year that had 78 players, and nine coaches on it, but there's also a ballot for the divisional ranks, the lower division schools. And that has over a hundred players and 32 coaches on it. And to that end, I, I tell you what, guys, uh, I'm going to get on my soapbox real quickly and make a case for my guy, Chris George. If there is a college football hall of fame and Chris George isn't in it, there shouldn't be a college football hall of fame. I mean, he dominated his level of play like no football player I have ever seen. What Tavon did against Oklahoma, Chris did things like that every other week. I mean, it was ridiculous. You're talking about a guy who I remember a game he had 23 catches for 303 yards and returned a punt for a touchdown. Mm -hmm. He had almost 200 yards in a national championship game we played. Uh Uh, Jerry Rice caught more footballs than any player at any level in the history of college football when he was at Mississippi Valley State. Jerry Rice caught 310 passes, more than any player who ever walked the earth with 310 catches. Chris George had 430. Mm-hmm. What in the world is going on if this guy, the most dominant football player at his level to ever put on cleats, is not part of this group? This is insane. 
This is why the structure and the process is flawed. Uh, I encourage people, become a member. Again, the only control you have, become a member, try and do something about it that way. If we have more regional voters, we'll have more regional folks maybe have a chance to make the cut, right? But at the end of the day, back when people, I mean, I remember when we were running our offense in the early 90s, Owen, I had to, when we played somebody defensively to get ready and watch some tape, the first thing I had to do was go to their third and long reel. Because that's the only way they do that. That was the closest I could come to having any idea what they were going to do to defend us. Because nobody else was doing what we were doing, right? And Chris was putting up numbers that were three and four times ahead of the next guy uh, in our league. It was just insane. And he did it week after week after week after week. I can't tell you the number of times he had 10 catches at the half. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, they would bracket coverage and push it down to him. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. And I, I can't tell you the number of times that I didn't see him and I was in trouble in the pocket and I put the ball up knowing at best I'd hear the crowd go nuts. At worst, it was incomplete. Nothing <laughs> bad was going to happen. He'd see to it. I can't tell you the number of times I did that. I mean, he made a rusty nickel look like a dime every day of the week. And, and this guy was just special. He was unbelievable. Uh, Rich recognized it and showcased him in a very special way in our offense. We had a lot of talented guys. Speaking about great O-lines, we had a great O-line. We had a great run game. We had some other talented receivers. But Chris was just different. I mean, I, I'm telling you. what. Like I said, the Tavon factor that we had when you saw Tavon play at our level with the, the Mountaineers and the Big 12 and the Big East, uh, it, it was that kind of pop at the D2 level and at the NAIA level. It was just nobody had an answer for him ever. Nobody ever had an answer for him. And he was just, I mean, he, you know, he had a couple cups of coffee in the NFL, spent some time in Canada. Uh, yeah, it looks like Eagles, Steelers, guys, and, and CFL. Had he played yeah. 20 years later, uh, there's no doubt in my mind he's on a roster. He was one of those guys. He was a true slot. I mean, he was our why, and you know what that means in that offense. So, and I mean, we're talking Darius Raynaud type mm -hmm. role, but just imagine Darius Raynaud if you're putting in the air 50 times a game and pushing yeah. it his way. I mean, it was just when all is lost, just dump a quick, quick screen to him and watch him go. I mean, it was uh, guys. I, I mean, I, I remember like we had so many read elements post snap in terms of your first read was vertical on the read post. You know what I'm talking about, Owen? Well, like we're in the national championship game out in Oklahoma against East Central Oklahoma, coached by Todd Graham, their D coordinator, right? That's where Rich met Todd Graham. High octane and, football. That's right. So, Oh, and they got me. They they, they showed two man pre snap cover eight, right? And I thought it was two man. And I thought, hey, you screwing with me? So I motioned around. I got the motion man. I got I bought it. Okay, two man, two man. It's true, two man. And so we had a zone con. Well, not a zone concept full side. We had a zone concept to one side, a man concept to the other side. But really, no quick answer throw built in. So wouldn't you know it? I stayed in the play. I thought, all right, we're good. We're good. I'll go to the to the man side. So we stay in the play. The ball snapped. As soon as it hit my hands, I see both safeties jump our slots. And I see the peelers coming off the edge. The will and the strong safety, they're in zero. They disguised it. I was like, you got me. You oh, you got me. Oh, no. no. What? So I'm racing through my mind. All right, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm stuck in this play. So I'm thinking, all right, zone, zone, zone. No, forget zone. So I'm racing back to backside where I remember Chris had a read post backside. He was the top end of our man, our man cup backside. Well, I knew it was zero, and I knew Chris had a read post. He ain't pulling up and cover zero, all right? You know what I'm saying, Owen? He's taking that thing deep. So I had these peelers come free. I had us in the wrong protection because I thought, oh, we're good. It's two man, right? Five man. Yeah, we're good. So here come the peelers running free to, to basically just have a Jed sandwich off the edge, right? And I have like a second and a half to do something. And I was like, Chris is running that read post. And he was nowhere near the read post. I took a shot to the ribs. I flung that thing down the far hash, where which would have been his target point for the read post if he kept running full speed, got on his horse. I got the living daylights knocked out of me. I'm rolling on the turf, the spray-painted turf out in the national championship game. And I heard the crowd go nuts. And I thought, something big happened. And I rolled over and looked past the freaking Will Backer that smashed me. And I saw Chris just flying toward the end zone, 60 yards touchdown. Uh, he was just special. He was just special. I'm telling you, it was uh, – when you played with guys, I mean, yeah, you know, it's fun the way you talk about Pat, the way you glow, 
when you talk about Pat. You know, it's, I'd like to think I glow like that when I talk about Chris. I mean, that's just, th th there's something there. And this dude is an absolute college football Hall of Famer, or that's an absolute disservice to the process and to the Hall if he's not part of it. It's 10 years now he's been on the ballot. Well, not only do we have a respect to campaign here on the podcast, it sounds like we've now got a uh, elect Chris George campaign as well, yes. too. How about that? <laughs> and a body of work elect Pat White, right? Yeah, hey, I mean, his I did. I pulled up his numbers here while you were talking. They are insane. 430 career receptions, over 6,000 yards, 50, uh, 52 touchdowns. I mean. My senior year was his junior year. He had 144 catches, 2,200 yards. Yeah. Yep. He National was, record, 144 receptions in a season. Insane. Manny Hazard at Houston with the Dave Klingler offenses caught 143. That's the closest to him in one season at any level. So, but he, he was doing this back in the early 90s. You kidding me? You know, that's but, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. No, I, I, we, we, we got to get Chris in there. I, I love the, uh, I love the passion from you. Uh, my quick little couple minutes of research here. I think you're absolutely correct. Um, it's the College Football Hall of Fame. It's not the Division One Hall of Fame. It's not the Power Five Hall of Fame. Uh, it's the College Football Hall yes, of Fame. It's the College and, Football Hall of Fame. Yeah, if you um, if you dominate your level of football like that, I I think you you certainly have uh, just as good a case of anybody. And man, uh, you you laid out a great one there for Chris. That's and good the body stuff. of work part for Pat. I mean, that's what frustrates me. In other words, when you look when Pat White was playing. OK, he was competing against in terms of awards, the Sam Bradford's of the world, the Tim Tebow's of the world. Brady Quinn slipped a few in there. Uh, Colt McCoy, uh, Graham Harrell, Matt Stafford. Again, I mentioned Tebow because you're not an All-American on one of the five recognized teams. OK, what did you do over the arc of your career? First of all, Steve was a first team All-American. Oh, and so yep. there's there's a chance that one day he could, you know, what I mean, be up for this. So but Pat, if you look at his body of work. The four bowl wins, unprecedented in college football. Uh, I still say, despite what Denard did, because that was kind of slippery, what Denard did as a senior, some of those rushing yards came as a running back. To me, Pat White is your all-time leading rusher among quarterbacks and always will be. So, anyway, that's the kind of way I look at it. No, I think you're right. There's there's a lot there's a lot of ways to judge people. We we live in a society now where you got to play for the best team and win all the championships to a lot of times to get recognition. But um, I don't think that's always the case. Uh, you look at the way that Pat White elevated a program. Uh, you look like you know, like I think like Michael. If you you look back, Michael Vick didn't really win anything, right? Yeah. Didn't win a national championship in college. Didn't win a Super Bowl. But but you can't tell me Michael Vick didn't have just as big of an impact as anybody else. Allen yeah. Iverson, right? Allen yeah. Iverson didn't never won a championship. Pretty got got there. got to a couple. But you can't tell me Allen Iverson didn't change the game and have impact. I think yeah. Pat White is kind of in Pretty that same look. conversation yeah. with those two. If you just look at the 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 sheet, it might not say champion and some of the things that you want to check the yeah. box. But if you were alive during that time. You knew what it meant. You knew the impact and the legacy that it left. And I think you're right, Jed. I think in these conversations, that's just as important, if not more so to me, than just what your stats look like or what your accomplishments look like on a piece of paper. I think that's a big part of the conversation. Great way of putting it. Agreed. Well, well said, gentlemen. This was uh, this was a lot of fun today. And, uh, yeah, another award-winning edition of ITG here as we respect to and we elect Chris George. Uh, thanks to uh, to all of our partners for putting on <clears> – <throat> This episode of ITG for us. We will uh, obviously have more for you next week. We're still working on some off-season guests, so uh, so keep uh, keep locked in here as we'll keep rolling throughout the summer as we get closer and closer to uh, to some more football here and uh, in just a few months. ITGfootball.com for all of your uh, your ITG central needs, our social media, our shop, and everything is on there. And of course, the one thing that we always ask of you is to be an ear and tell an ear about your new favorite WVU football podcast for the beer truck, Owen Schmidt, and the signal caller who was carried by Chris George in college, Jed Drenning. I am Wesley Euler. Thanks for listening, everybody. You've been in the gun.